Appreciate everybody being here this morning. Appreciate the prayers that have gone before, even before Brother Ron's prayer here this morning for our efforts uh, today. I, uh, we've, or we have been studying uh, the everlasting covenant for the last several weeks. In fact, I have here on my notes that we started this back on the 21st of February, so this is a I guess it would be about the fourth message um, on the subject. We, our text that we want to continue to look at in regards to the everlasting covenant is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 5. 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 5, where it is written, Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure for this is all my salvation and all my desire although he make it not to grow we have spent some time already concerning uh, the fact that David acknowledges here in the first part of this verse how that his house is not so with God meaning uh, as you read earlier in the context you know, he talks about how that one that rules over men uh, ought to be, must be, not just ought, but must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And uh, when you think about that in relation to David, we talked about how that there was much awry in the house of David. There was not just uh, with his family, as it were, but David himself had made some some really horrible blunders, okay, in his, in his life. Um, and so, you know, when David kind of scrutinized, evaluated, or and analyzed his own house in regards to what the rock of Israel had, had spoken by him here in this, in this text, uh, he realized, I'm, I'm not a just man. I'm not one that truly thoroughly, perfectly rules in the fear of God. Uh, and so, anyway, we, we noted how that while this is true of David, it's indeed true of all of the um, family of God. Uh, we're none perfect. We'll talk probably a little bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, we're none perfect. We're none as we ought to be. We're none what we wish to be in our practical living. Uh, and you know, if we if we have any hope of eternal life, it is due to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Anyway, uh, we spoke some you know about that that uh, situation. We talked also about the fact that David, in spite of the fact that his house is not the way he would wish it to be, not the way God would have it to be, yet God had made with him. He made, you know, we talked about this personal application of this covenant. He made with him an everlasting covenant. And he, in this covenant, it, it is ordered in all things. All right? It is, uh, every, you know, nothing's left to chance. Every detail is spelled out. And every detail that, uh, that is necessary for bringing about the end for what, that is purposed in this covenant Every detail it, uh, is uh, God will take care of Himself. Okay, God and and Christ. All right, it's ordered in all things, and it's sure. It's sure because God indeed takes care of it. And we we talked uh, uh, to great length about that last uh, last time. This morning we'd like to look at this next. Um, well, probably the remainder. Hopefully, if time permit, the remainder of this verse. Where he says, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. All right, is for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. We've already spent a great deal of time talking about some of the details of this covenant. What God had proposed to Christ, what God you know, had proposed that Christ would, uh, would handle, would take care of, and some of the promises that God had issued to Christ as far as uh, enabling him and um, uh, blessing him to, to do these things that, uh, that were in the covenant that Christ was to take care of. All the conditions that, 
that God had proposed to Christ to take care of, God would enable Christ to, to take care of that. All right, and that's the wording of that, I think, is very important, as Lord willing, we'll see a little bit later um, as we go forward in this, in this study. But here, David writes, this is all my salvation. The thing that is, that is uh, the subject under consideration, if you will, in this covenant is the salvation of God's people. Not just, not just the, uh, and I, sh I really don't like the way I just said that, but I don't know if it, another way to say this. Not just the fact that Christ would come, that he would be made man, uh, that he would dwell among us. That was part of the covenant. But his coming here was for the purpose of bringing many sons to glory. Bringing many of, of, you know, of the, bringing, in fact, all the elect to glory. To bringing them to eternal life. Uh, providing eternal life. Providing salvation uh, for all the elect of, of God. So, uh, David again says, for this is all my salvation. And this is pointing back to the covenant that God had made, as he puts it, with me. Um, though his house was not, uh, was not as it ought to be. Okay, so let's look for, for a little while here at some various scriptures that point to the fact that uh, that salvation, all right, that this covenant that God is that God has made, that this covenant salvation is purposed by it. All right, y'all and y'all pray for them. All right, so let's look first of all. Look at Ephesians chapter one. And I want, let's, let's notice several different words in this text or in this passage. Let's start at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Let me, let's read on, and then I'll go back and look at some of these, some of these things here that I want to point out to you. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Okay, so all of the blessings that are promised in the covenant are promised us in Christ Jesus. Okay? Notice that there in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us, that's God the Father's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing that we enjoy is in Christ Jesus, okay? We enjoy them because we are in Christ. Now, somebody might say, well, uh, all we've got to do is get in Christ and we'll enjoy those blessings. And friends, there is a lot of people in the world who teach that very idea that somehow by some thing you do, you can get yourself into Christ. But friends, that is so wrong, all right? And hopefully we'll see why that is. But anyway, notice this. <clears throat> Keep your finger there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse, let, let's read, um, let's get verse 29 as well. But notice, notice what Paul here, again by divine inspiration, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll get verse 29. In fact, let's go back. Paul writes very long sentences. All right, so we're going to just get mid-sentence here so that we know who we who we are talking about. Um, uh, let's see. 
Let's start at verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. All right? But of him, notice this next phrase, but of him are ye in Christ. Did you see that? But of him are ye in Christ. Of who? Who's the him referring back to? It's referring back to God. Of God, we are in Christ. God puts us in Christ. See, you see that? Okay? God is the one who puts us in Christ. In fact, we'll see that here even uh, more clearly, I think, in Ephesians here in just a moment. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Okay? So heavenly places, by the way, according to the translators, could also be uh, translated heavenly things in Christ. There are lots of heavenly things, all right, that we are uh, the very blessed in recipients of. Uh, and these in Christ. And boy, you know, as I think about that, I just there's all kinds of different things that come to mind. But anyway, according, that word according means in harmony with. All right? According as he hath chosen us in him, that is, God the Father has chosen us in Christ Jesus. All right? Before the foundation of the world. When did the everlasting covenant, when was this contrived? When was this made? When was this formed? When was it designed? When was it planned? When was it written up? When was it agreed to? It all happened before the world was. And one of the blessings of the everlasting covenant, one of the things of the everlasting covenant is our being chosen in Christ Jesus. Okay? Now you might say, well, was it, uh, is that part of the covenant or did that precede the covenant? And I would say yes, okay? That's kind of like asking the question, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, and of course, we know the answer to that because we've read the book, right? The chicken came before the egg, just, just in case you didn't know that. But, but you know, it's whether, you know, God's eternal. And I'm a temporal creature and trying to figure out eternal things when all I've got to relate to is time, it's really hard for me to pinpoint, you know, things of eternity. You understand? All right, nevertheless, be that as it may, according as he hath chosen us in him, the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ are in harmony with the fact that he's chosen us in Jesus Christ. The only reason you enjoy these blessings is because he's chosen you in Christ. Okay? Now, he did this, as we said, and as he says here, before the foundation of the world. So before there was it, before there was light, before there was a sun, before there was a moon, before there was land, before there was water, before there was anything in this universe, God had already chosen you in Jesus Christ. God had already formed this covenant. And he even formed this plan to have you in his presence, having the holiness of God, having the righteousness of God, and enjoying eternal life forever and ever. Amen. He already planned this before all this was made. All right? Now, hence, let's go back. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, you know, one brother was here one time who, who spoke on this text and said, Blessed be the God that is speak well of God. Let us speak well of God. God is worthy. Why is he worthy? Because he's God, first of all, and because he hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing, blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Is this good yet? Okay. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Hey. Well, let me, let me read on. <clears throat> let me not get sidetracked. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. <clears throat> now, some in the world today <clears throat> teach a, an election 
which let me think, let me, I think the term is a prescient, pre-science, but you know, science, a prescient uh, uh, election. In other words, what they believe is that God, in his omniscience, before the world was, he looked down through the time, you know, through time, and he saw everyone who would choose him. Uh, everyone that would accept Christ as their personal Savior. Everyone that would do good works. Everyone that would love him and that he, ch he chose them in Christ. Okay? Well, there's something wrong with that. All right? Let, let's, let's just point out the obvious here. Notice that the purpose of election is that we might be before him without blame and in love. Did you see that? Without blame. The cause, or excuse me, the result of election is blamelessness. Are you, are you kind of getting this here? You know, being right and being chosen is, it, well, it's just not right. <laughs> right? There we go. Okay, so at any rate, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now notice this, having predestinated us, and we talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago, about this word predestination. You know, it's a real scary word, right? I mean, it's so scary that most of the Christian world today, they just somehow or another, they just skip right over that word when they're reading their Bibles. In fact, probably some of the Bibles they're using today don't even have that word. They got some other word to substitute in its place. I don't know. What do you, what do you think, Brother Brian? Anyway, you know, so this, this, notice having, notice what he says here. Having predestinated us. When did that happen? Before the foundation of the world. So he chose us in Christ that we should be uh, before him without blame and in love having predestinated us he did that when he chose us he chose us and predestinated us all right what did he in fact let's predestinate what does that mean okay so pre is before right and then so before a destiny was prescribed was determined so predetermined so before determined it was before determined when was it determined again before the foundation of the world. That's when he did this. This is what the text is saying to us. Having predestinated us to what? Unto the adoption of children. All right? By Jesus Christ to himself. So who's doing the adopting? God is doing the adopting. God has adopted us He's predestinated us to the adoption to, to be brought into his family. Now, every time I think about this, about us being adopted into the family of God, being a family member, being a child of God, when I think about that, and I, I'm, like, I'm kind of like you know, uh, uh, John when he writes there, and probably nowhere near to the degree that he was marveling when he wrote this, when he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Paul, excuse me, John, when he writes that statement, when he says, Behold, he's, he's you know, y'all have heard me say this before. It, you know, John is, he's grabbing me by the lapel of my jacket and he, he shakes me, all right, Robin did that to me one time, told me to encourage myself in the Lord, okay? And I just had to do that a few times through my life of, of being married to her. Anyway, <laughs> John, he grabs me by the lapel of my jacket. He shakes me and says, I want you to pay attention to what I'm going to tell you. This is extremely important. This is important to your peace today, friends. He says, behold, what manner of love. Now that phrase, what manner of, is that deer in the headlights kind of, 
you know, feeling. It's just exactly, it's exactly the same word that the disciples use whenever Jesus was asleep in the ship. The wind and the waves are beating against the ship. The ship is full of water, did not sink, filled with water. They woke him up. Carest thou not that we perish, they say to him, and several other things. And he rises up. He speaks to the winds and the waves and says, peace, be still. And immediately the water was dead calm. There's not even the least little breeze on the water. No ripples on the water. And in all their fright from the sea, now they're like, what manner of man is this? They are blown away. Their fears of the winds and the waves now is replaced by the fears of this man that is, oh, this is awesome. This is, this is something that, that only deity can do. Which, by the way, like us, they so often forgot. Right. You know? But again, John uses that phrase, what manner? This is jaw-dropping kind of love. I mean, it is amazing. Why is it so amazing? It's so amazing because when you consider who we are, he says, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Get it, y'all. It's us that he says he loves. He loves us with such a great love, so great a love, that he brought us into his family. Job reckoned, us, reckoned himself as a worm of the dust. We're vile and wretched. We are so unclean in and of ourselves. We are despicable. We, you cannot find enough ugly words to describe what man is by nature, but what, what we are by nature. And yet he took us as vile and corrupt as we are. And he made us children of God. That takes a great love. Would you not agree? He adopted us. He chose us. And why, you know, when he chose, when he looked over the mass of humanity, he wasn't looking at the ones who were the least sinful. He wasn't looking for the ones who were the least corrupt. He wasn't looking for the ones who were the least vile. They're all together become unprofitable. They're all vanity. They're all just purely just rotten to the core. There's not a good one in the bunch. They're not just a few bad apples. Their whole bushel is rotten. And it needs to go out on the garbage heap, you see. And yet, out of that big mass of corruption, God loved people out of that mass. And he brought them into his family. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself. And you know what? It just occurred to me something else from this text. Notice here, according to the good pleasure of his will. When Jesus, when, when God did this, God did not do this reluctantly. Are y'all listening here this morning? Is, as Foghorn Leghorn says, is any of this getting through to you, boy? All right? Let it sink into your ears. It's kind of like that old uh, Kent Hughes. No, maybe it was Kent Hughes. R. Kent Hughes in his book, The Disciplines of a Godly Man. He talks about boring your ear. You let these things sink into your mind. Let them sink into your heart. Let these words enter deeply, you know, and hide them in your heart. God loves you to, enough to bring you into his family, to make you an heir. I wrote a note, and I don't know who said this, but I wrote this little note in the front of my Bible many, many years ago. Four ways of inheritance. The first one on the list is adoption. God has predestinated 
All those that he chose in Christ, he's predestinated them to the adoption of children. And because they are adopted, because they are predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself, they are heirs. You've heard me say before, so this is not anything new. We're heirs of God. Not only are we God's heirs, but our inheritance, if you'll have it, it didn't matter because I believe it. Not only are we God's heirs, but our inheritance is God. Our portion, do you see, is God. Just like when you read in the Old Testament about the Levitical priesthood, you know, you know about the Levites. They had no inheritance in Canaan's land. God was their inheritance. It can't be any truer for God's elect. He is our portion. God is our portion. Now, I don't understand and I don't comprehend everything that is entailed in that statement. Nevertheless, it's true. We, God is the portion of his people. He is the portion, he is the inheritance of his people. Okay? All right, so having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Again, God wasn't reluctant in this. He said, well, okay, I'll have that one. No, God delighted in that one. And then you say, well, why? And you know, the, the answer to that question is, I have no idea. Because if you are true to yourself, if you are, if you'll be, you know, if you'll just speak the truth for just a moment about yourself, <clears throat> if you'll acknowledge he's exactly who you are, you'll say, you know what? I had no idea why he chose me. I had no idea why he loves me. You know, behold, what man of love the Father bestowed upon me. You know, just like John. You know, you've heard me say this before as well. John refers to himself in the Gospel of John as that disciple whom Jesus loved six times. John's still marveling. Guess what? It's 2,000 years later. John's still marveling. They would love him. And it's just as marvelous when we look at ourselves. You know, when we look at us, why would you love me? I have no idea why he would love me. There's every reason in the world why he shouldn't love me. Amen? Is that true of y'all? I know it's true of me. There's no reason in me that he should love me. I mean, when I look at me, when I evaluate, my, evaluate myself against his law, I should die ten thousands upon ten thousands of deaths. And yet, he loves me. Just like David said, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. So God wasn't reluctant in this choice, in this election of his people. God was not reluctant in his predestinating them unto the adoption of children. He delighted in each and every one of them. We go on. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the blood. The only reason you can attribute your being adopted <clears throat> into his family, the only reason you can attribute to your being predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, we'll get that Lord willing in just a moment, the only reason that you can you can uh, attribute to your being before him without blame and in love is holy by His grace. Amen. Holy 
is wholly owing to his grace. Because as we said, there is nothing in us that commends us to his favor. Nothing in us that commends us to his love. Nothing in us that commends us to being brought into his family. John Gill, you've heard me quote him before. John Gill said, you know, it's one thing to pardon somebody, to pardon a criminal, you know, to open up the jailhouse door and say, okay, you're free to go. Your, your crimes have been pardoned. But it's altogether a different thing to take that same individual and bring him into your family and make him an heir. Can you imagine? That's what God does with his people. He's taking these vile criminals, sinners, who were haters of God, and he's brought them into his family. Man, what grace! What amazing, astonishing grace this is. You know, I heard this past week, I think it was, I was listening to a sermon, I forget now who it was, who, was, who made this statement. He made it in, the, in, the, in connection with God forbid, the word God forbid. Whenever you read that phrase, God forbid, in the New Testament, John, uh, the Apostle Paul makes use of that phrase several times. <clears throat> and I can't remember them all. But the, the preacher, when he was making mention of this phrase, he said, you know, it's used whenever something just really preposterous is offered. Okay? Now think about this. How preposterous it is to think that our sin could abound above His grace. God forbid I want you to understand that there is no sin that God's grace does not overcome. In fact, if you'll allow me to say it this way, there is no sin in any of the elect of God from the beginning of time to the end of time that God's grace did not already overcome in Jesus Christ. Amen. How about that? Okay. Paul says in Ephesians 1 and 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace. How glorious is this grace? God desires that you praise Him for the glory of His grace. And you know what? When you begin to understand better and better the, 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 the grace of God, the love of God, this thing is easy to do, isn't it? It's easy to praise Him for His grace. When we see just how great this grace is, so great a grace that we have in Jesus Christ. Okay? And then He says, wherein, in this grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. God's grace has made us accepted in the Beloved. That is, in Jesus Christ. His grace. Well, I think it was because I did this. No, nope. if it was because you did this, it's not of grace, is it? It's of works. That's what Paul argues in the, in the Roman letter, letter, chapter 11. Otherwise, grace is of more grace. All right? It's not because you made a choice. It's not because you believed. Believe is an evidence of salvation, not a condition of salvation. Let me say that again. Belief is is an evidence of salvation, not a condition of salvation. Amen? Amen? You've got to have life before the signs of life are seen. God's grace has made us accepted in the blood. Here is one place where we read the word accepted or accept, and it's not the sinner accepting. It's God making us accepted in Christ. Okay? How important is that? It's very important. It's very important. Okay? I want you to understand, friends, that when, when David was 
ruminating over this everlasting covenant that is ordered in all things and sure, when, when he was thinking about how that there was nothing in this covenant that left anything to chance, that this caused him a great joy. It, it gave him great encouragement to know that his salvation was not, was not left in any aspect to, in the hands of men. It was all of the Lord, as, jo as Jonah said there in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9. Salvation is of the Lord. Okay? <clears throat> this ought to, it ought to be a great source of encouragement. In fact, I contend, and we've got so, a little bit of time left here. Hmm. Do I jump ahead? I contend that these things in this covenant, this everlasting covenant, is all our desire. Everything that we, that we would wish, everything that someone who's been enlivened, that has been quickened by, by the Spirit of God, that this, uh, that this covenant, all these details, it matches... And exceeds, I should say, exceeds all our desires. And friends, again, there's not one aspect of this covenant that anyone is going to desire unless they are one of the ones that are to be the beneficiary of this covenant. And have been quickened, given a, been created a new creature in Christ, so that now their old desires now are sort of pushed aside, as it were, and new desires given. Someone who is not enlivened, someone who is not quickened by the Spirit of God, Someone that has not been regenerated, born of God, whichever way you want to say that. Someone that is not born of God will not desire the things of the covenant, the everlasting covenant. It'll be just like as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 when he says, But the natural thing, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness, foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That person must be a spiritual person to discern the things of the Spirit of God. He can't know them unless he, is, unless he has the Spirit of God in him. It's like they used to say back when I was, well, a little bit younger. They used to say, you've got to have a receiver. You know, the radio waves are out there. Some of you guys don't know anything about that anymore. You gotta have a, you know, there's radio waves out there being broadcast. Well, there's cell phones now, right? You gotta have a cell phone to receive the signal. All right? <laughs> is, is that more up to date? Okay. You gotta have a cell phone. You know, the, 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 the waves are going out there. You know, they got that little tower over here. But the, the waves are going out there, but you gotta have a cell phone to receive the signal from that tower. Okay? You gotta have a receiver. You've got to have the Spirit of God in you to receive the things of the Spirit of God. The gospel will never make sense to anybody, which, by the way, the gospel you know, of, of, of Christ, it reveals the everlasting covenant. It reveals, it makes manifest the counsel of God. Okay, And you can, if you'll pay attention, as you're reading through the New Testament, you talk about the mystery of His will. The mystery of His will, He's talking about the everlasting covenant. It was concealed, but now in Jesus Christ it's made manifest. Okay, but anyway. You've got to be quickened in order to, to recognize it, to see it, and to enjoy it. The things of the Spirit of God. To, to be able to start appreciating what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Okay. So it's equal to our desire. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, there's, oh man, there's so much here. Let's go just a little bit further here in, in Ephesians chapter 1. 
He says, in whom, that is in the beloved, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And here we go with grace again. Okay? But notice this again. In whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. Now, it's not just barely blood here. It's not just barely blood. Blood is signifies something here. It signifies the death of Jesus Christ. You know, there's a scene in the Pirates of the Caribbean. My boys love those series of movies. But there's, a, I think it's the first one in that series where there's the curse of the Aztec gold. I forget what they called that anyway. Well, you know, there was a, the way to lift the curse was that you had to get all the coins back together, put them back in the chest, and then blood had to be shed of one of the ones that partook of that, you know, um, uh, that the curse came upon. Anyway, so the idea was they just had to cut themselves, shed a little bit of blood, drop it on top of the coins there, and then the curse is lifted. Well, there's no death. Do you see that? There was no death required, just the shedding of blood. Friends, when it speaks of redemption through his blood here, he's not talking about just barely cutting his hand here and shedding a little bit of blood and there we have redemption. No. This blood here speaks of the death of Jesus Christ, just like whenever in, um, in Egypt, whenever they instituted that first Passover, remember they set aside that Passover lamb, they slew that Passover lamb, they took the blood of that lamb and they applied it to the doorpost and the lintel. And when the destroyer came through the camp and he saw the, the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, he passed over that house and touched not the firstborn. The blood spoke to the sacrifice of the lamb. The lamb had to die. Do you see that? Christ had to die for us to be pardoned of our sins, to be, for our sins to be forgiven. It's not just barely the shedding of his blood. You know, there used to be back up. Uh, well, when I was much, much younger, there used to be this, time, uh, this, this idea that there was a, a Gethsemane atonement. Okay? And, and I guess they got this idea from, uh, from that passage, I think it's in Luke, where, where it says that Christ shed, as it were, great drops of blood. Or he sweat, rather. He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And so, you know, they got this idea that atonement was actually achieved there in Gethsemane, if I understood, if I understand that teaching correctly. Well, Jesus Christ did not die in Gethsemane. Okay? Jesus Christ didn't say it was finished in Gethsemane. Jesus Christ said it is finished when he's there on the cross at Calvary, just before committing his spirit to the Father. In whom we have redemption through his blood. His death, by his death, he has effected <clears throat> our redemption. We said a few weeks ago how Hebrews records for us how he obtained eternal redemption for us. Now again, that's in the past tense. It's already done. We're not waiting to get that. We've got it in Jesus Christ. He's obtained that for us. He did that for us. Those who are who were given to him uh, uh, by, by the Father. We read that in John chapter 6 about verse 38. All that the Father has given me shall come to me, and him that come to me I will no wise cast out. All those that the Father gave him, all those he obtained eternal redemption for when he died at Calvary. When he died at Calvary, he, by his, by his death, he has, uh, he has taken away the curse of sin. You know, as he said there in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, when he said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ effected that salvation when he died. He didn't effect the salvation when the nails pierced his hands. He did not affect the salvation when the nail pierced his feet. He affected that salvation when he died. Y'all understand that? In him, or in whom we have redemption, 
through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. <clears throat> Think about this expression, the forgiveness of sins, in whom we have the forgiveness of sins. There's a lot of different ways that forgiveness is understood. But I'd like to entertain for a moment here that when we speak of forgiveness from the perspective of God, that God treats us when He's forgiven us as if we never committed a fault. Now, when we forgive others, we don't exactly do that. Now, we may not reward them according to their iniquities, but I may not trust them anymore. Y'all understand? Like, for instance, <clears throat> a kleptomaniac, I forgive him from, for stealing something of mine. But that does not mean that while I have forgiven him and I don't hold him accountable anymore for stealing whatever it is he stole from me, it does not mean that now I trust him to keep my goods in my house when I go off on a week-long vacation. In fact, if I did, that would just be plain dumb. Okay? That would be foolish on my part. But God, are you listening? He treats you like you never sinned. Think about that. You know, there used to be this song about this little cabin, you know, in the corner of, you know, in the corner of heaven. You know, that would be his place, you know, that sort of thing. You know, he's looking, just, I just, just a little cabin, you know, in, you know, in the corner of heaven, that sort of thing. Friends, you take a David who committed adultery, who committed murder, and multiplied to himself wives, and whatever else you know, his faults are. And then you take somebody like, well, I don't even know who to compare him to, somebody that might, you might judge to be better as far as their life here. The two of them, you might say, well, you know, one was a greater sinner than the other. So, you know, one's going to enjoy, you know, less benefits in heaven than the other. Friends, that's not the case when God forgives his people in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> they're all treated like they're the same. In fact, they're treated like they are Christ. You know why? You know why? Because we have the obedience of Christ to our account. All our sins have been taken away. They're, they're cast behind his back. They are as far from, you know, as the east is from the west from us. He has uh, 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 cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. He remembers them against us no more. Isn't that amazing? These, this, what we're, what we're talking about here this morning, trying to, is we're trying to describe that this everlasting covenant is all our salvation. It, 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 it takes in the salvation of all the elect of God. Not only does it take in the, the, the salvation of, a, of a God's people, eternally speaking, but if you'll have it here this morning, <coughs> I believe that David, in a very real sense, as we've already described, David could say that this covenant to me right now, in this very moment, is all my salvation. There's a deliverance in ruminating and thinking upon and believing in the everlasting covenant that God made in eternity past in Christ Jesus. That we have all these blessings, not because I'm just right and perfect in, my, in myself, but because Jesus Christ is just right and perfect. And I'm just in Him, not in me. I can say with David, yet He hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. And this is all my salvation. For this is all my salvation and all my desire.
although he make it not to grow, which I think just simply means this. I don't need anything else. It's got every and more conceivable blessing intended. I cannot desire any more. I cannot want any more. I will not lack any good thing. Because this covenant has ordered it and it's sure. May the Lord add his blessing.